Migrants, the story of us all, is described as an alternative history of the world in which migration is restored to the heart of the human story. So it places the idea of the migrant and the sedentary in a deep and broad context. Can you tell us a little bit about what motivated you to write this book? It's, is it a topic you've been thinking about for some time or was there a specific event or uh, encounter that made you feel that this needed to be written now? <coughs> Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, great. Um, yes, it's something I've been thinking about for ages. It's a book I tried to write some years ago. Um, I think I realized, though, at a certain point, it needed to be written in a special way. And that's a way that recognized how human beings as a species are fundamentally migratory. Before that, I'd been caught up in particular little migration issues, big issues to the migrants and the other communities involved. But I think there was a sudden realization that these are stories that go back to the beginning of our species' time on this earth. And what is so striking about this species is that there is no other land mammal that has traveled to so many parts of the globe. The only animal that comes close is the rat, and they've followed us uh, largely. A few dogs have come as our companions in more recent millennia. Uh, the point of that is that also a recognition that until about the 19th century, we, on the whole, recognized that we were migratory. And it's really only in the 20th century and more recently that these huge battles in which communities, nations, claim to have been in the same place for all eternity, almost as a way of driving out migrants, has happened. And it's an argument that we all know is incredibly toxic. Uh, there is no quicker way to bring about a war of words and often more a war of other kinds than migration issues. And we forget our common history. We forget that once upon a time, all our ancestors were migrants. Many of us are migrants today and that migration is at the very heart of that story. One of the things I hadn't realized, but I'd ne just never talk, uh, thought about it and uh, related to what you were saying is that passports are not that old in the scheme of things. There was a time when people didn't have them and then they tried to get rid of them. Can you just say something yeah. about that? The, uh, some Can we you, get rid of them? <laughs> yeah. so, some of you may know a, a famous Central European writer called Stefan Zweig who records in his memoirs, written in, I think, 1943, just before he committed suicide, uh, that he told his students how he traveled all the way around the world, including to this country, before the First World War without a passport, and they didn't believe him. And that shows how quickly, and this is the early 1920s when it happens, passports and visas and in a lot of places, borders that were lines rather than areas became normal. What we forget is that these are recent modern human inventions. Uh, and there are lots of people who, it continued into, into the 60s, that there were United Nations committees that talked about the idea of us eliminating visas and passports. Obviously, the EU at times has tried to do similar things, um, but it didn't feel like the utopian dream that it does now, sadly, in my view. And Suresh, your book is absolutely fascinating, and I, I wanted to ask you about how you wrote it, because I think to write it, you looked at archaeological evidence, but also texts from many language uh, sources to illustrate the journey of plants that I think we take for granted as just being there, like rice and cotton and citrus and melons and cucumbers. 
um, that mood from tropical Asia to Western Asia. You introduce your approach uh, to your book as a model of writing history that sort of dialogues uh, between historical, the social, and the biological. And Sam, I think that's been your approach too, because uh, you've also brought autobiographical elements to the stories you tell. And to me, this is a really important approach because it breaks down probably unnatural boundaries. So um, why, why was it so important for you to persist in bringing this together? It, were, were there any parts you found harder to navigate than others while writing it? Thank you, Arati. So, um, just very briefly, this book tells a very particular kind of migration. It's using plants as proxies for human movements, and it's not a unilateral sort of you know migration either. It, there's a lot of going back and forth. So, I would call it circulation uh, rather than migration. And uh, I, I chronicle the stories of uh, crops like rice, cotton, citrus fruits, and as you alluded to earlier. Uh, in much earlier periods, it's harder to deal with simply just the documentary sources. Uh, words for plants are notoriously slippery in a lot of ancient texts. Right? The same word could be used to describe multiple plants. If we take the Latin malum, for example, which is often translated as apple, uh, that could be misleading because in reality it describes any large, round, fleshy fruit, not just apples. So citruses, for example, were called Persian, Median, or Indian apples. Uh, in Latin. Uh, and, and this is why it's absolutely essential to have archaeology in this picture. Uh, it's, it's only with that sort of integrated approach that we can sort of gesture at the reality of these movements of plants and humans. I mean, the movement of plants by themselves is very interesting. I mean, they have their own adaptation mechanisms. Uh, plants moving from the tropical zone into the temperate regions, for example, they sort of become less photoperiod sensitive because of changes in daylight. Uh, but they're also very useful in telling us the human stories, the humans who are moving these crops. Uh, and, and, and sometimes they're doing it not because the, you know, the region that they're moving to does not have that crop. You know, they, they just ha uh, there is this idea that crops from the homeland were somehow better than uh, the, the, the place that they were going towards. A good example of this um, is Greeks migrating to Hellenistic Egypt. This is around the third and second centuries uh, BCE. Uh, they decided to bring along with them cabbage, chickpeas, and figs from Greece. Uh, it's not that Egypt was lacking in these crops, it's just that they thought the ones from Greece were much better than the ones you could find in Egypt. Like, it's that beautiful British apples. <laughs> Um, what about you, Sam? How did you choose to have this kind of interdisciplinary approach? And you're a journalist, I guess, so not a biologist. How did you find it writing the chapters about your uh, genetic history, for example? Well, I needed a lot of help. Um, uh, my approach, yes, is deliberately uh, sort of interdisciplinary, and I weave in a lot of personal stories, a story, for instance, of my great aunt, um, who was an extraordinary migrant, but but what I'm with with the DNA material, uh, we're suddenly seeing something that's changing fundamentally. What we're learning from people's DNA uh, gives us, and from ancient DNA, gives us a sudden new insight. I think it's been difficult for a lot of historians, a lot of journalists, to actually get it their head round it, and they need scientists who can explain those results um, effectively. But what it means is that we can track a lot of those ancient migrations, either through the bones of people who lived then, or by looking back at the DNA of the past. And I like, Suresh, your use of the word circulation, because so much of migration is exactly that. Is people moving not as, as suggested by those maps we see in history books, with huge great arrows stretching across continents, but actually millions of smaller movements. Lots of people returned. It's forgotten in the Americas that the European migrate, with the European migration to America, about a third of those who went from Europe uh, in, the in the sort of second half of the 19th century actually didn't like it terribly and returned. We have these very simplistic views of what's happened in the past. And what's been brilliant with, the, say, the DNA discoveries is that we've been able to unpick that and bring a lot more nuance. Thank you. Um, Suresh, I wondered if you would mind reading the first part of your introduction because it gives a, a really wonderful um, 
a sense of the topic that you've taken on. Sure. Okay. So, the past is perhaps most foreign in the sensory experience of everyday life. Half a millennium ago, the world not only looked different, but also smelled and tasted different. Imagine Italy without tomatoes, Australia without cattle, Florida without oranges, India without chilies, France without tobacco, Colombia without coffee, and Switzerland without chocolate. The regime of diseases afflicting humans was also markedly different. The peoples of the New World had no experience of smallpox, the now extinct dreadful pustular rash and other viral and bacterial infections endemic to the Old World. The Afro-European colonization of the Americas brought little short of a revolution in the biosphere, irrevocably fusing the ecosystems, agricultural regimes, and dietary habits of the old and new worlds. Traveling across the Atlantic from the new world were pumpkins, squashes, maize, peanuts, pineapples, guava, cacao, chili peppers, cashews, cassavas, tomatoes, papayas, sunflowers, and potatoes, among other crops, while wheat, barley, rice, oats, sugarcane, coffee, bananas, citruses, and other old world mainstays traveled to the Americas to become part of a labor-intensive, often slavery-based, cash cropping system. The year 1492 inaugurated a world without biological borders and inadvertently one of the worst ecological demographic disasters. The influx of peoples, livestock and food crops also opened a Pandora's box of free-ranging weeds, pests, common cells and microbes and their attendant diseases whose impact on the native populations of the Americas was calamitous. So interesting. Um, We can come back to the calamity because I know that's something you talked about at length uh, also, Sam, and you can't, it's not something that can be ignored in this narrative. But I wondered if you would read a short piece from your book. Um, I'm going to just read a bit from the American sequence uh, in the book. A lot of it's about how Europeans in particular and lots of other countries, including this one, almost deny their migratory past. Uh, and obviously, that's not so in America. Migration plays a major role in most of the foundation narratives that are central to America. Now, I'm just going to read a little passage out. It's something of an experiment. And I'm going to ask you a question at the end. Now, if you know the answer or have read the book, don't say. I want you to make a good guess. Okay, here goes. Try this. Tell a friend the story of Joseph Kearney. For he was an Irishman, a middle-aged shoemaker in the tiny village of Moneygall in County Offaly, born and brought up there in the late 18th century. And, like hundreds of thousands of other people from Ireland, Kearney migrated to America during the Great Famine, settling in the Midwestern state of Ohio. Once there, he sent back home for his family, his wife and three children, and they all came to Ohio and became citizens of the USA in the days when it was easier to do such things. Joseph Kearney died an American. Now tell your friend that a descendant of Joseph Kearney of the Irish village of Moneygall became President of the United States. And then ask your friend to guess the name of the President. Any ideas out there who that might be? Can't hear you. Anyone else? Any other suggestions? Shout it out. Trump, we have a, we have a Trump, Trump, we have a okay. Kennedy, and we have an Obama. Most people get it wrong again and again. They try Clinton, or the Bushes, or Reagan, or Kennedy, or Biden, or even Donald Trump. The answer, as one man got it at the back, is Barack Obama, 
who was the great-great-grandson of Joseph Kearney, the shoemaker from Moneygall. Obama himself has complex and eloquent views on race and of his own racial heritage. And he wouldn't be surprised or offended, I think, that many people wouldn't choose him as an obvious descendant of an Irish shoemaker. Obama considers himself black, but has always been keen to embrace his mixed heritage. Um, and Barack Obama's identity served as a battleground for America's racial politics. He faced accusations from the right that he was a foreigner or Muslim, or both, while to a variety of genealogical pedants and amateur logicians, Obama was quite simply not black by the fact of being half white. To old-fashioned white racists, though, he was undi undeniably black, though they would often use another word, under the one-drop rule, only removed from the legal codes of several states during the 1960s, and according to which anyone with any black ancestry whatsoever was black. The debate about Obama's identity swirled on through the presidency and was a reminder of a deeper, wider malaise in American life. It's hard not to see this debate as a symbol of unfinished business, of the extent to which race and slavery and the many migrations of the past continue to play a central role in American politics and society. Those migrations are at the heart of many familiar stories that are told about the USA and its origins. And I cannot claim, as I have about other times and places, that migration tales have been ignored. It's different in the USA. Migration is center stage. I'll just one, add one codicil. Uh, uh, some of you may know uh, that Obama was and he discovered this only when he was president, was in fact descended from slaves, but not through his black father, but through his white mother. Um, indeed, he was probably descended from the first black migrant from Africa to be enslaved in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. There's so much more I could ask you. There's so much in your book about these weird origin stories that the Americans uh, sort of created for themselves, but do get the book and read it. It's, it's very rich. Um, it's also a very beautifully written, deeply researched book, but it is funny. It's really funny at times. I, I found myself laughing out, uh, out loud on the, on the train. And, uh, but what you touched on was actually quite some difficult histories, like slavery, like the early European colonial migrations that led to mass mortality and extinction of whole lineages of, of people. Um, and that history is quite difficult to read. You also write of pogroms, anti-Semitism that affected your own family. I find it painful to read because it is uh, not fiction. It really happened, but also because it's not really history. I mean, the impacts of what happened then are still very much uh, living histories. Um, that, that affect people today. I wondered if you found any of it difficult to research or write, and, um, and, and, and I also wanted to hear more about great auntie Polly and that sort of positive uh, impact of migration, as I guess Obama's story also includes. No, I mean, it is and should be, in my view, very hard to write about slavery. Uh, and. I remember, and I actually describe in the book, having an, uh, almost an argument with a friend who said, I shouldn't be describing slavery as migration. And it is under the definition I've set forward for migration, but we're talking about people who had very, very little power over their own lives. They were forced across the Atlantic. They were forcibly captured. I would argue it's still a migration because it changed their lives and they were living in a new place, permanently in most cases. And that's part of the definition of migration. But this, the stories that 
one has to read to research it are about, for instance, people on board slave ships who choose to kill themselves, who throw themselves over the side. And I, in a way, came round. There was a very impressive article I read about this, which was almost a philosophical argument, saying that we need to respect those people's decisions to kill themselves and stop thinking of them as people who had no power over their lives. They had this tiny bit of thing. And remember what they were doing to the slavers. The slavers did want them alive because they were their property and they were going to sell them. So there was an act of rebellion there that was suicide. And that, for me, is the example of the passages that were, the, the, I think, the most difficult to write. Um, I think we all know about the situation in America. You were hinting at it or talking about it in terms of what happened after 1492 and the decimation of communities in large parts of first the Caribbean and then the American mainland. Um, and these are still deeply shocking and terrible stories. I think it's very important again to tell them and that we must not forget them and we must not forget what happened. And even when the voices of those who died have disappeared, I think it's critical that, for instance, or it's very significant that lots of novelists have tried to restore that, those voices. We may not be able to do it as historians because those voices are lost forever. But, for instance, the story of the, Ty of the Taino nation, uh, the people who lived on what is now Haiti and the Dominican Republic have been kept alive by oral tradition and more recently written writing, which has been very impressive. And I think that's important. Um, do you want me to talk about Aunt Polly or should uh, we come on to Yeah, I'd love that? to hear about Aunt Polly. Okay. So uh, as a child, I, part of my family is Jewish. Um, just I'm a quarter Jewish, but it comes through my mother's line. So by the laws of Judaism, I'm a, I'm a Jew. But I wasn't brought up as one. But about once or twice a year, we'd be dragged off to huge great parties of my Jewish relatives. And there was one woman who was all, always there, Great Aunt Polly, who uh, was famous for turning off her hearing aid when anyone else spoke. And my father always thought she was the most absurd character. I actually rather liked her because she was one of those older adults who remembered my name. And I wasn't a very sort of appealing child, I, I think, looking back. And she was one of the people who would happily talk to me. And later she taught me chess. Uh, she died in the 1990s. I went to her funeral and didn't think anything more of it until talking to my mother who said that She'd uh, written an autobiography, which was incomplete um, because she got Alzheimer's in the course of writing it, in which she told the story of her life. And suddenly when I read this book, this cartoonish woman was transformed into a kind of extraordinary, in a way, heroine of the early 20th century. She was born, I think, on the 10th day of... 1900 witnessed her earliest memories in Zhitomir in Ukraine. Her earliest memories were of a pogrom there, of seeing Jews thrown to the grounds, their brains on the streets of Zhitomir. Uh, there's a, she, took, she lives through the Russian Revolution, and in 1918 there's another pogrom, and she talks to the leader of the people who enter her house to kill her family and talks them down, offering them tea and biscuits. And eventually they are so shocked by this woman, this 18-year-old woman, that they don't kill the people in that house and they move on and do it elsewhere. She then escapes, she's almost burnt to death, and gets on what is the first post-Balfour declaration ship 
uh, to carry uh, loads of uh, Jewish refugees to uh, what is Palestine. She arrives there as a pioneer, realized quickly that that life is not for her and neither are the politics, flees to Poland where she gets the rest of her family free, sends them to Palestine, goes to Berlin to study physics and maths and studies under Albert Einstein. Uh, she then goes to Britain on a scholarship paid for by my great-grandfather who was a rich Jewish scientist living in Cambridge who meets her. He's recently been widowed um, and proposes to her. Uh, she says, no, you're too old for me. Six months later, she gets married to his son. <laughs> and that's the story of Aunt Polly. She goes on to write some novels in, what, in English in what was her sixth language, which was astonishing. She learnt Ukrainian, Russian, Yiddish, Hebrew and German. She was much better in all of those languages than in English, but she wrote in English. That's the story of my great aunt Polly that I only recently discovered. And these um, vicissitudes of migration are incredibly interesting, aren't they? All it could have gone in so many directions, and it doesn't. And I want to come back to plants with uh, those um, many routes of travel. I wanted to ask you to tell us a bit more about the the role of plant foods or products as agents of intercultural dialogue and exchange, much as people were, or maybe plants traveling with people and what their role was in this. And I think you say this is a long process and I think far longer than, than, many, of us, than many of us imagine. You talk about the Neolithic some 6,000 years ago, uh, about exchanges at the time of Mesopotamian, Assyrian, Babylonian, uh, Roman empires as an example of, of the process of intercultural exchange. So, as an example, can we talk about maybe South Asian um, cotton, if that's a good example to use, or rice, or both? I think personally, I'm particularly intrigued by citrus. And just because, I mean, people, I think, have a sense that cotton is, people say Egyptian cotton, don't they, or Indian cotton. Um, and rice, probably most of us know it's sort of Asian, right? But citrus, it's a bit more murky. Everybody thinks it's theirs. Um, Valencian oranges, Sicilian lemonade, Californian navel oranges. So can you tell us uh, about this long road and maybe a specific example, its journey, um, as you say, from familiarization to in, in indigenization? So the trajectory that these crops take, uh, it's really convoluted. I mean, some of them have protracted domestication processes in more than one area. And rice, for example, uh, has two do main domestication centers, China and uh, South Asia, the Gangetic Valley in particular. Uh, going back to citrus fruits, I mean, they're really interesting. I mean, most of these are native to uh, what is today mainland Southeast Asia with a disjunctive distribution and parts of South Asia as well. Uh, and they travel slowly, mostly in the middle of the first millennium BCE, when we had the Achaemenid Persian Empire ruling a good part of the world between what is today Bulgaria to South Asia. So the presence of imperial polities allows for such long distance of crops. So uh, th there need to be a lot of factors coming into play, uh, which sort of compel the movement of both humans and the, and the, and the crops that they're carrying along with them. Uh, with citruses, there are not a lot of uh, wild citrus species, like the lemon and sweet orange. You would never find a wild lemon tree, and that's because they are anthropogenic hybrids. Humans have brought together different citrus species uh, to make the lemon. Uh, the citron is the male parent of the uh, lemon, and that was the earliest citrus fruit to travel to the Mediterranean. And as, and as I alluded to earlier, it's called the Median or Persian apple because it goes through the Persian Empire and ends up in the Mediterranean. And the Greeks are uh, acquainted with this uh, fruit through the Persians, hence Persian or Median apple. Rice also has an interesting journey. Um, it gets to the uh, Mediterranean by the middle end of the first millennium BCE. It's definitely in Iran by the uh, middle of the first millennium BCE. And what's interesting about rice is that the way in which it consumes changes from where it originates from and where it ends up uh, in. Uh, in most parts of tropical Asia, India, Southeast Asia, China, we tend to consume rice as boiled grain 
but in the Middle East, they would make it into bread. Now, it's gluten-free, so it's not an ideal grain crop to be making into bread. Uh, but because they were a culture acquainted with bread making, right? Uh, that's what you would do with wheat and barley. Uh, that's what they did with rice, right? It was the most instinctive thing for you to do if you were a culture that mostly consumed bread. You would make the incoming grain crop into bread as well. So Even you grind it into flour first, that's right, just several yeah. stages in yep. processing it. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, the, even though these new crops and foods are coming in, the peoples are consuming it in ways that were familiar to them. And some people, you know, avoided them altogether. We are told by Plutarch, for instance, that some old people, uh, he's a Roman writer, uh, he, he tells us that some old people could not consume citron or pepper or these novelties coming from India. It was just too much for them, right? Uh, and farmers, too, tend to be conservative. So, innovation was, uh, you know, happening in selective ways, and it needed particular factors for that to happen. But uh, with rice, uh, uh, although the consumption patterns did not migrate with this crop, uh, the cultural attitudes did. That's really interesting. Uh, many cultures that adopted rice saw rice as superior to other kinds of grain crops. Uh, so with lots of uh, sources from the Caspian region of Iran, for example, where rice is a staple, uh, and, and they tell us that you know there was cult uh, strong cultural disdain for wheat, uh, and barley. Uh, there is a really interesting 19, 1830 report which tells us that you know uh, parents were telling misbehaving children something along the lines of, "I'm going to send you to a wheat-eating country." <laughs> right. So um, that that's how ingrained rice became. And if you read Chinese ethnographies, uh, one thing that we'd always be writing down is whether the culture that they're writing about is consuming rice. That was a roundabout way of asking, "Are you civilized?" Right. <laughs> We are all very civilized here. We, we, we love rice. Um, and I, 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 were you talking about when potatoes went to Ireland? And did uh, I read that? Um, did people think it was toxic? Or was uh, that, that was true of potatoes and tomatoes. Uh, it took about two centuries for both of these to acclimatize in, in European cuisine and culture. Uh, F uh, Frederick the Great of Prussia, for example, sort of you know had these. Uh, advertising campaigns to get farmers to grow potatoes. Uh, there was a lot of resistance to new crops. Uh, and, and, and that also happens in cultures which already had something similar. So in potatoes case, in a lot of uh, Eurasia, uh, tuberous crops like uh, taro, for example, were consumed in ways that are similar to how we would consume potatoes. In medieval Cairo, uh, they used to dice taro and fry it very much like fries. Um, but, you know, the potatoes slowly took over some of these roles held by tuberous crops like taro. So now it's the reverse. We're familiar with the potato and not some of these other tuberous crops like taro. So I've got one final question to you both um, before we turn over to audience questions. So keep your questions in mind. Um, Sam, you know, in one of your intermissions, you, so Sam has these, throughout his book, he has, would you call them reflective chapters, maybe? They certainly allowed me to kind of adopt a different tone mm. from the sort of purer history of the main chapters, that's right. I, I feel like that space in the book to reflect and contextualize the research that you did in the chapters before, um, and the histories you progressively cover, and I, I love that approach because it gives the reader, or if any of you are aspiring writers, um, insights into your thought processes when things worked and when they didn't work and how you'd go to the next um, part. It kind of reminded me of Steinbeck's diary of a novel where he um, he's just very honest. There's a lot of humility and humanity um, there. But anyway, in one of these intermissions you discuss a question that's been the bane of my existence. Which is where are you from? Where are you really from? Um, and you've ad you admit that you've done this, and I do this, and I've started, because I live in London, London's nearly 50% ethnic minority, mm. so it's sort of a minority majority mm. place. Um, and I started saying, maybe, uh, what, what's your ancestry when it comes up in conversation? But because I live in, a, in London, I'm in a white majority country. And I never get, I never, it never stops. I, I never stop getting asked where I'm from. And at one stage, I was at my university. I was at UCL, and I don't know if you know the Cruciform Building. It's a big red brick building that used to be the hospital of the university, and that was the only place I was able to answer this question once without really thinking. And I was at a Christmas party, and one of the professors said to me, "Where are you from?" The thing is, I happened to be born in that hospital. <laughs> so, so I said, here. 
But I think for most of us who as you are recent migrants or who feel like migrants, or that awful, terrible term that you talk at length about expat, which I absolutely abhor, um, the question is a minefield, and maybe it's a bit more philosophical. So is there more to it? I wanted to end by asking both of you, after having been immersed in writing and thinking about these books about movements of plants or people, people or potatoes, it doesn't matter. What to you does it mean to belong to a place? And how long does it take to not be foreign? To, how do you answer the question, if, if is something from, from here? Uh, quick side note. The, uh, the, the, my great grandfather, who was a scientist, was actually a potato scientist. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to join this up a bit more and wrote a book which is mo much mocked to this day on social media because of its name, which is The History and Social Influence of the Potato. At uh, home, I mean... This have, you, have you read that book, Suresh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, home. I, I would say there are about 10% of people who I talk to who, when I say... I don't want to be home. I quite like being a foreigner. Get it. And I'd say about 90% don't. They're searching for their home or they're in their home. I think there's a minority of us who like being on the move, who find excitement in newness, in being an outsider of Obviously, maybe being this insider-outsider, as I feel here, I lived in Delhi for 15 years, so it was and still feels in many ways like my home, but it's not. I'm back in London. I'm actually back. Uh, also, I'm staying in London with my mother since the beginning of COVID, my mother and daughter, and I'm in the house that I was actually born in. And for someone who's written a book about migrants, uh, that feels a bit strange. Um, but for me, I don't know where home is. Home is wherever I'm settling for a few months. And that's really what I like doing. And I think writing this book has helped me kind of realize that uh, and express it rather than it being a kind of inner mood or feeling. What are your thoughts, Suresh? I think plants are a great way of questioning identity, challenging identity. All of you would be longing for lunch right now, so uh, go back and have a look at your plates and look at how many products come from somewhere else in the world. Uh, there are a lot of things that are called you know, national foods or dishes. I'm not going to get into trouble by naming any of these, uh, but you know, a lot of these things probably originate from somewhere else in the world, and they have human stories interconnected with those plants that arrive on the plate. So I ex exhort you to look at your plates later on and figure out what your identity is like in relation to what you're consuming. Thank you. So thank you both, and I'd like to open up to the audience. And do we have someone passing a, a microphone around? Uh, there's, a, yeah, one just near you at the front here. The gentleman in the hat, in front. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, migrations have all, always followed opportunities wherever they rise. So if you take the graph forward, do you think uh, migration will now occur to the tracks up north where presently Iceland or Siberia or northern Canada and these snows will melt due to climate change? Who'd yeah. like to take that? Um, yes, it's a simple answer, but I would say it's much more complicated than that. Um, I think people who are naturally sedentary, who the people I was just talking about, the majority, see migrants as people who are forced, for some reason or other, to move, 
that they want a better education, they're fleeing, fleeing climate change or persecution. And that's very, very often the case. But I think if you look back at the long history of human beings, we've got to reflect on the fact that many of us over the years have chosen to move because we're curious. We want to see what's around the next corner. There's no other way really of explaining why boats took out into the Pacific 2,000, 1,000 years ago into the blank space of, of, of the ocean. Uh, and it's the only way we can begin to explain why our nearest species cousins, the chimpanzees, have remained and developed in West Africa in the place where we left them about seven uh, million years ago. So yes, climate change, uh, there are a huge number of reasons for migration. The one that we forget is that people want to migrate and for many of us there's a very significant and fundamental urge to do just that. And, and as has happened in the past, we assume that with climate change, there will only be more migration rather than, rather than less. And I think what you're saying is it's what we've always done and it's what we always will do. I guess we'll have to think about what kind of food we'll find when we get to these places and how we then acclimatize them. Um, there's a lady in white in the, in the, in the aisle. I am a lab physician, and my question to Sam Miller is, do you think DNA is the answer? Because when we do DNA analysis, we'll find we are more different than what we think we are. For example, in America, most white people will feel they have a lot of black genes, and they may look white, but they are indeed black. And so that is one way of coming together. What do you think? I think it's a very useful corrective a lot of the time. It's dangerous sometimes. I have a friend who, who encouraged her, uh, her sister-in-law to be to do a DNA test and discovered things about parentage that were very damaging to that family, secrets that were well hidden. So it's a dangerous weapon at times, but it's, I think it's a brilliant corrective. There are wonderful videos on YouTube of uh, uh, white American racists discovering how, what percentage uh, black they are. And yeah, I can't pretend there isn't a pleasure in, <laughs> in, in watching that. But it's not, it gives you a very partial picture. It doesn't replace history at all. It's an assistance to getting, to, to almost digging deeper and seeing the overall picture, in fact, with greater complexity rather than the simplicity that we've tended to inflict on the past. You, you've used genetic studies in your work as well, haven't you? That's right, uh, plant genetic studies in this case. But you know, he, uh, ancient DNA studies is also taking off amazingly. I mean, there's a wonderful recent discovery in Cambodia uh, from a first to second century cemetery where the individual has about you know 40 to 50 percent of his genome that can be traced back to South India and it gives credence to these you know older stories about you know Indian migrants coming into Southeast Asia Wonderful. and we have a lady in orange jacket at the front and then there was a, a young man in um, a black and red white jacket there good morning uh, my question is to Sam for thank you for sharing the story of your great aunt uh, Polly, but she was a brave woman to take the decision for her family to migrate. But most of the time we observe that it's a man of the family who takes the decision and women either left behind or tagged along. But in recent times, uh, there is a slight trend that uh, single women or women on their own have started migrating. So what is your take on that? So there's an interesting 19th century geographer called Ravenstein who actually revealed that in Britain in the 19th century it was women who migrated more than men. They would often migrate smaller distances. They wouldn't do the grand heroic trips across the Atlantic on their own, but they would be the ones who would take up jobs in, across um, the country, say in Britain. Uh, and in most but not all societies, it's the woman who moves, who migrates at marriage. Uh, and so the notion that 
that men are the main migrants is actually not really true unless you've got a very narrow defini definition of what migration is. Um, and to this day, the huge numbers of women continue to migrate with families and without. Um, and I think it's sort of more recognized. What, what was interesting, though, for me in, in writing the story is that you get very few named women migrants from before about the 18th century. So many men, very, very few women. They, haven't, they didn't do the, these grand show-off journeys around the world. It, there are some who did, but finding those stories yeah, is still no, difficult. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have one question. Um, okay, a lady in green there, but there's a lady in a, a beige coat on this side of the... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, hello, sirs and ma'am. Uh, so, migration can also be affected by events that happen in the world. Okay, so for America, uh, there is this fear factor that has been there throughout the years. So, is, is it just because of a fear of the unknown? Because even movies such as My Name is Khan brings out how people who migrate suffer because they are misunderstood. Is that a cause just because they, because the local people fear of what, because they fear of the people who migrate? Um, I, I would say a, a lot, yes, but a lot of the time politicians for very uh, rational but bad uh, logical reasons encourage that. Uh, they behave as if migration isn't normal. They behave as though they're not descended from migrants, often, particularly in the case of America, usually very recent migrants. It's a nonsense, really. Um, I think I fear we're coming to an end. I just want to point to one thing that in a way connects our books, which is that movement is universal. We humans have this, I think, terrible tendency to freeze everything as if it were still, uh, as if that is the only way we can imagine this universe if we stop it from moving. But everything, plants, obviously, but even a, a, a dull pebble has traveled across the universe. Inside it are atoms that are spinning around at great speed, and inside those atoms are subatomic particles. So that, this isn't what my book is about, but there is something fundamental there about how we should be seeing the world. We know that plants move. That's how plants are everywhere in the world. And we've speeded it up by taking them around the world, but they're on the move anyway. That's how they got there. And it's interesting that the, the, there is fear of people, but there's also been fear of plants as well. We're at time. I'm, I'm really sorry. I know we had two more questions, but Sam will be signing books. Suresh will be signing books uh, afterwards. So please uh, take the opportunity to speak to the authors, and please let's thank, thank them again for their wonderful talks.